spirit. Amen. And this morning, I am delighted to invite you to participate in the meditation on the theme, The Witnessing Disciple, along with which we also contemplate on the Christian discipleship itself. When we talk about the discipleship, we remember, of course, from the scripture, the three major sets of disciples, Guru and Sishya, are the teacher and his disciple. One set was Moses and Joshua, those who participated in a very historic and a very concrete event in the history of crossing of Red Sea. The second set of disciple with his master was Elisha with his master Eliza. A very devout, deeply moving spiritual you know, couplet of Guru Sishya the master and disciple and loaded with full of uh, miracles in those days and then followed by Paul and Timothy, one of the remarkable uh, master and disciple couplet in the scripture in the New Testament particularly who traveled so much, who taught you know, enormous precepts in the history of the church which have been pondered and read again and again through the last 2000 years, causing the foundations of the church in different parts of the world. Of course, we have plenty of masters, and disciples in the history before and after Christ, like great teachers like uh, Plato, Aristotle, coming in the New Testament like Gamaliel. In our own Indian context, you know, no one can forget a great epic personality like Dronacharya in the Mahabharata. When we come into the Holy Scriptures, there is no one greater than John the Baptist. When you discuss about the discipleship in the Scripture, particularly in the uh, post uh, yeah, Jesus Christ scenario in the New Testament, we have two readings in the Scripture. But I read one from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 3, a few verses from 25 to 27. I read it for you. John 3, beginning at verse 25. Now some of John's disciples had opened a discussion with a Jews about purification. So they went to John and said, Rabbi, the man who was with you on the far side of the Jordan, the man to whom you bore witness, is baptizing now, and everyone is going to him. John replied, A man can lay claim only to what is given him from heaven. You yourselves can bear me out. I said, I myself am not the Christ. I am the one who has been sent in front of him. I myself am not the Christ. I am the one who has been sent in front of him. As forerunner, when um, I had a few definitely visits to Holy Land, on different occasions to study tour, on study tour. And every every time I go into the small village, 
about five miles towards southwest of Jerusalem, a small cool village called Ain Karim, Ain Karim, which simply means springs in the midst of vineyard. And at the entrance of that village, it is written, Hic precursor domini, not us est, which simply means, here one who precedes Lord was born. To put it in our easy understanding, welcome to the village of the one who preceded our Lord. Who preceded our Lord? The forerunner. The morning star of the salvific history and the one who did not see cross, did not see the resurrection, did not see the ascension, but who could foresee everything in a capsule and he witnessed to the Lord and he could really view everything that would come along with the Lord Jesus and therefore he witnessed about Jesus Christ. It is in this context we go to see the overall structure of the master and discipleship relationship. The Greek word mathetos, again I remind you whenever I speak a few Greek words, it's simply to remind us that the New Testament was written in the Greek language. Obviously, we discuss about the root words that are written, which have been translated in many uh, versions in different ways, in different languages. So, when we go to the root word mathetos, which has the noun manteno, is learning, the process of learning, jnana, the whole process of you know receiving the knowledge itself is mathetos means the disciple in other words a disciple is not just to follow the master but it is something to learn something to receive from the treasure of knowledge and wisdom of the master we have a very humorous story of the disciples of Swami Paramananda in, uh, you know, in our, our own language it calls Paramananda Yasishinu, the story and uh, you know the series of events you know and every event has some laughter and humor in it and uh, mud headed and lack of wisdom, wit and timely activity and the master always felt so sad about the disciples. But a teacher or a master is proud when his or her student or pupil becomes so receptive. At least 50% of what a teacher would like to impart goes into the mind of the student and the teacher is fulfilled. This is the story of every teacher universally in the world. When it comes into the context of the Christian structure, Christian discipleship is something unique. It doesn't stop just after learning something. It is not a methodology academically, but it is something to engage himself or herself in this whole process of learning and also to imitate the teacher. Thomas Akimpis, in the early church, has written a beautiful meditation called Imitation to Christ. In that imitation to Christ, the desert, you know, devotional, spiritual scenario, wherein there has been a lot of struggle, suffering in following Jesus. And this is how the Christian discipleship becomes 
most unique in the history of discipleship. There are number of disciples. When you look back into the 2000 years loaded history of the church, the history is not filled with kings, prophets, or seers, or the leaders. But it also has something to learn about the disciples and discipleship in the church. There are innumerable number of unheard stories that went into the silence. I would say the mystery of silence. The stories and witnesses of the disciples. But we are asked to meditate upon a particular disciple today is the witnessing disciple in person of John the Baptist. Quite possibly we take a model, we take a case study, we take an exemplary portrayal of a disciple. When it comes to the Old Testament, it has been a very emotional and uh, um, you know, hot throbbing event that we see when prophet Eliza was to exit from the earthly abode and his disciple Elisha, prophet Elisha was following him. You see that in the book of, second book of Kings verses 1 to 15, the whole process is that Eliza did not want his disciple to know how he would exit. He would move from place to place, from Gilgal to Bethel and Bethel uh, to different places, particularly finally it goes up to Jordan and he said, why are you following me, Elisha? He comes out with full of agony and feeling to say, now tell me, where are you going? And then Eliza says, today my Lord God is taking me and so I have to leave this place. Then Elisha says, if that is the case, I still want you to be here. Then Eliza asks him, make your request, what can I do for you before I am taken? from you. And with a lot of anguish, Elisha requests him for a double share of his master's spirit. There are usually people ask for, you know, please give me your coat or give me your whatever costly thing that you are having. But then he asks double share of the spirit. Very authentic, very realistic disciple, a spiritual follower would want something from the master with which the master followed and exercised his spiritual powers. And that was a context where when Eliza, before going, he said, okay, if you see anything falling on you, then that, that means you receive my power. And while doing so, a chariot comes, the chariot of Israel. The chariot of fire appeared and horses of fire coming between the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in the whirlwind, which is very unique in the entire Old Testament scripture. Such experience did not come to any other prophet. Elisha shouts, with full of feelings and emotion, my father, my father, chariot of Israel and its chargers. Then he lost sight of him. Taking hold of his clothes, he tore them in half. And a little later, the mantle of Eliza fell on him. 
with which Elisha struck the water and he divided it to right and left and Elisha crossed the water. I would still call it a unique experience, a unique discipleship. Who genuinely longed for the spiritual power of the Master? To my mind, in my reading of the scripture, I found three great prophets in the Bible. I would call three classical prophets. The first one was no less than Moses, who never claimed himself as a prophet, of course, three radical prophets. I use this word radical because each one has something to carve in the society towards a constructive transformation of the people of God. Moses. Moses was used as the instrument in the hands of God, the mighty arms of God, Yahweh, Yahweh, for the liberation and redemption of his people. It was not an easy thing. However, limited Moses was. God used him as the prophet of liberation. The one who could stand before the ruler himself with courage. And then he guided and led the people of Israel through the deserts towards the promised land of Canaan. The second prophet, prophet one, perhaps many of us and most of us highly respect and admire was Prophet Eliza. Prophet Eliza. You know, these two have rendered a lot of miracles, both Moses and Eliza, who lived at a very crucial period of history. And the third, I come to John the Baptist. You may not consider him as Old Testament prophet. You cannot also take him as New Testament prophet because the prophecies were seized after Malachi. It was during the time of Malachi. You know, the prophecy was written in Malachi chapter 3. Behold, I send my messenger. And it ends up in Malachi 4 verse 6. The messenger is to prepare the way before me, means the coming of the Lord was certain and there was a messenger to come and people expected that messenger was Eliza. It was in the context of Zechariah's prayer in the Holy of Holies in the temple, a devout priest heard the, pray, heard the voice of God. Fear not, Zechariah, for your prayers heard, and your wife Elizabeth shall bear you a son, and you shall call him John. A devout person. Right on Wednesday, we have celebrated the feast of John the Baptist, a commemoration of John the Baptist. And therefore, we focus our thoughts on this disciple in the context of the witnessing disciple. He had a wonderful mother like Elizabeth. Again, a very humble woman, a senior lady, and who came running when a young dame, her kinswoman, stood in front of her to receive her, Elizabeth, she ran and he said, Mother of my Lord, discovering the embodiment of the tri benedictus means the three blessings in one simple young woman standing before her in person of Maria or Mary. Such humility that Elizabeth exhibited Perhaps she bent while she recognized the divinity in the womb of Mary. 
in Luke's Gospel. Zechariah's song was so splendid and meaningful, so spiritual and devotional. Reminds us in first chapter, verse 76 of St. Luke's Gospel, And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. The one who comes not with pride, arrogance, but who was so molded, so tuned to suit to the purpose of the coming of the Lord. And the one who grew, one day he came up, he said, the message, repentance and forgiveness. In view of the judgment, preparing people to turn towards the Lord. And it was so exciting to hear about him, such a certificate, qualifying, you know, witness that he shall be the great in the sight of the Lord, and he shall be filled with Holy Spirit. Interestingly, on three occasions, when you refer, all the three, like uh, Father, Zachariah, Mother, Elizabeth, and John himself, and Luke chapter 1, verse 15, verse 41, verse 67, three of them in this family were filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't you find the uniqueness of the family? Family who were tuned, molded, shaped in the hold of the Holy Spirit. John himself, at a very tender age, perhaps he was sent to training at Qumran community, what is it called, the scenes. Those mendicants exercising and practicing the lonely spiritual training who are tuned in the principle of constant cleansing. You know, keeping a small pot with a small hole, you know, the water, it touches the head drop by drop, cleansing. Perhaps John the Baptist learned it from them and he all of a sudden appeared at the river Jordan. And the story where the story of uh, Eliza and Elisha stopped. Perhaps it is the same place John the Baptist appears and then he starts his ministry of baptizing people for repentance and forgiveness. He was called Nebi Yahya. Yahya means, you know, Yahweh, other form of Yahweh. You know, I would like to quickly explain about the character and characteristic features of John the Baptist. Firstly, John left a very cool, pleasant, green area coupled with the constant association of the parents at Ayn Khalim, only to live in the option to get trained at Qumran in a warm and a dry, hot atmosphere where a scene is always lived. Secondly, the teaching of John the Baptist was so, you know, queer, which exhibits utmost humility when he showed Jesus as uh, the Lamb of God. Behold, the Lamb of God. And he teaches him to increase and me to decrease. And no one would say that if I had grown as a big man in my life in the society, I would always say, yeah, he was trained by me. And all the time I say about how I sent him for training and how grew, I groomed him. But we never think that how he really became that worthy disciple of a lot of persuasion and learning. And here John says, him to increase and me to decrease. The morning star of salvific history. And he was the first monk in the New Testament 
if you want to call the beginning of New Testament already with his coming, after 400 years, you know, gap of prophecy, the man who stood for the truth, he stood for the dignity, he stood for the divinity and integrity of the marriage, the human family, against Herod too, son of Herod the Great. John did not accept the pollution that distorted the ethics, human ethics. And he stood for the purity of his religion. He was first and faithful teacher in the church. And then I would say he was the first prophet in the New Testament. I would say he was the first martyr. Interestingly, the Greek word martyria means witness. Witness is not something to talk about Jesus and to show uh, the greatness of the master. But witness, it is loaded with suffering and strife. There is a sense of sacrifice, marturia, from which this word, the word comes martyr, suffering. That is why our Lord also has witnessed about him. If anyone talks about John, of all the ch children are born of women, there is no one greater than John. John was the greatest among all those who are born to any woman. He shall be greatest in the sight of the Lord and he shall be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, the name himself, John, itself talks about the meaning, gracious gift of God. Lord has mercy. Friends, among these three radical, radical prophets, they have learned so much in their life and they taught so much, enormous, to the rest of the history of the church. We are talking about marturia, suffering, and the strife in the life which really gives a living example of the discipleship. And in 2000 years history, we have seen enormous number of disciples who lost their lives. Even from the first and second centuries under Nero and Domitian rule. And until in the recent contemporaneous time, in the last two years, when you go through the history of the church, there were 21 Egyptian Christians were beheaded by Isis in Egypt, not very far from Cairo, in a, a village called Avaud. All 21 are like John the Baptists, the Coptic Christian martyrs. There are 41 Christians, you know, the bloodbath took place in Libya, the barbaric massacre and you find in the history around our own communities like in Iraq, Syria, Somalia, Nairobi, Pakistan, North Korea, by Taliban's, the Christians have been suffering. In North Korea, 30,000 Christians were put in like a concentration camp for a new word is called re-education. Re-education means bring them back to their own faith from Christianity. And the slogan, when they were beheaded, all these Egyptian Coptic martyrs said, E Rabbi Isu, O oh my Lord Jesus. That was the you know, last word that was uttered. We are talking about you know, all other countries. How about our own country, India? You know, next door from, from my context, in Varisa, Arunachal Pradesh, 
in several other places and we still undergo this kind of persecutions sometimes you know this vandalism in the name of their fundamentalist faith and it went up to so devilish manifestations that took away the dignity of humanity in and around the churches the recent week you know kannada santosh and other around 20 of our indian soldiers were killed on the border of indo china we simply you know paid our homage and expressed our solidarity the grief the pain of the womb of the mothers i am reminded of these 21 coptic martyrs or 41 martyrs in libya and many others even in our country those whose history is not highlighted the suffering that is kept in the discipleship christian discipleship this word is so much attached when you read the book of the cost of christian discipleship which was written by one of the greatest witnesses lived in our contemporaneous you know history no less than pastor dietrich bonhoeffer from germany who lived around 30 1937 who brought out this book and finally he was executed by hanging in the year 1945 and the cost of discipleship he talks about the exposition on sermon on the mount in which one of her spells out what he believes christ means what it means of christ to his personal life fully loaded with sacrifice and suffering that is why even our lord said in luke's gospel 14 verse 27 who say ever does not bear his cross follow me cannot be my disciple and in another context he said if anyone wants to be a follower of mine let him renounce himself and take his yoke or his cross it's not easy maturia and to become martyr a martyr toss is not just to be a glorious uh, picture to say that i am a disciple of dr russell chandra and a dr samartha and great names in this country in the christian church but there is something different that something unique is to be a mathetos to have maturia to become a witness even that it goes up to you know to become a martyr he was greatest the sight of the lord and he shall be filled with the holy spirit it is in this context my dear friends we talk about the discipleship the christian discipleship it involves not only just suffering but involves qualitative you know witness of the life qualitative the exemplary living out of our faith in this country it is not exclusivizing ourselves it is not manifesting a fundamental faith of us but it is something so radically you know translating the teachings of our lord towards a constructive and a concrete transformation of the life of the people in our land perhaps this is nothing to do with just becoming a pastor or a shepherd and these are all different vocations but christian discipleship is something that goes from grassroots level that 
Every Christian is a Christian disciple. It doesn't have titles. A Christian disciple is the one who follows, he practices. John the Baptist had courage and guts to say, I am not Christ. If I baptize in water, he will baptize with Holy Spirit and with Holy Fire. He could envision, you know, he had the darshan and his vision of the one who was to come. Therefore, he became heroic in the sight of the church and who remained as an unshakable model of the history of the church. Whenever you talk about the discipleship, John the Baptist stands. Whenever you want to teach, I personally see one of us, the cost of discipleship, and who taught, who wrote from prison, particularly from his letters from prison, and every letter moving, and finally he was executed and he was hanged in Germany. He lived in concentrated camp during the time of Nazi rule. The church in India is safe. We are so free. You can be here in this country from anywhere to anywhere. And you can proclaim your gospel, you can experience your spiritual uh, life. But how much Christian discipleship that we exhibit? It is not that quantitatively you say that, you know, I am a Christian disciple, but a qualitative Christian discipleship, a remarkable with an imprint of John the Baptist, or our contemporaneous disciple, Bonhoeffer. Let us spend a moment in silence, not only now, let us continue to deliberate this in our contemporaneous context of our country. You know, when people are dying, people are dying due to pandemic, and you have got a lot of other forces coming in, the force of violence, oppression in our country. And we may have to, you know, speak out. Our silence and neutrality is not divine. Our passivity is not divine, and you have to speak out for truth. Of course, John the Baptist, he did that up towards beheaded experience. And we may have to imitate some of these great lives of Christian discipleship in the land. And it is in this context I would like you to meditate upon what kind of Christian discipleship that I exhibit in my own land. Shall we close our eyes? A small prayer. Oh Lord, hear my prayer. Oh Lord, hear my prayer. When I call answer me Oh Lord hear my prayer Oh Lord hear my prayer Come and listen to me Oh Lord hear my prayer Oh Lord hear my prayer I need you beside me. O oh Lord, hear my prayer. O oh Lord, hear my prayer. I need you to guide me. Amen. God bless you.